So um, this evening's webinar, the, the idea is, is I'm going to probably talk really for about 45 minutes uh, about restorative materials, uh, particularly restorative materials for difficult cases or time sensitive cases, difficult patients. Um, and I'm going to talk about a new um, solution, a new material, um, which is a self uh, adhesive composite hybrid material from Densply Serona. So just to give you uh, a little bit of an introduction, I mean, we're all aware of the direct restorative material options that we have, ranging from good old amalgam, which was very much what I was brought up with, um, and then the shift historically over the last sort of 20, 25 years to direct composite. And then Glass Ornum has been with us for quite some time, um, largely I would say as a temporary material or maybe as a base material. And then the manufacturers started to improve the glass ornamers. So we have these um, strengthened glass ornamers, things like um, Fuji 9, uh, things like Kemphil Rock. And then we also have the resin modified glass ornamers, things like Fuji 2 LC. Um, and there's been a bit of a, a tendency, I think, for some abuse of materials. So especially dentists that perhaps want to place amalgams, um, but for whatever reason they can't place an amalgam, perhaps it's a child or um, the, so they might want to place a, a composite, but they find that maybe a bit too time consuming or a bit too tricky. Um, so they might be tempted to place one of these improved glass ornament materials um, just as a, almost like a quick fix. But certainly what I've found in practice that ends up often leading to disappointment for both the clinician and for the patient. So is there another, and this is what the little red um, circle represents, is there another um, potential way of if we're getting rid of amalgam within our practices and I think dentistry there's no question that amalgam is being going to be phased out because of minimata um, the composite which I think is a fantastic material most of my practice is based on composite direct composite um, but is there another way of placing a composite like um, material without, with some of the benefits of a glass ornama, um, but without the disadvantages of a glass ornama. And that's really what I'm going to spend the first part of the presentation talking about these various pros and cons. And then we'll come on to the, uh, the little red circle with the question mark is what else is out there now that you can actually use in your practices. So um, I'm Ian Klein. So please do call me Ian in the questions uh, at the end. If you do have questions as we go, as you think of them, by all means, type them in. But I can't actually see your questions as they come in. So at the end of the presentation, at about 45 minutes time, we'll go through all the questions. If I don't get opportunity to answer um, your uh, your question uh, live, then by all means drop me an email, Ian at mac.com. Um, I'm very much a wet fingered dentist in practice, so I'm a partner in a purely private practice um, at the Bloomsbury Dental Practice, um, which is just by the uh, British Museum in central London. And normally I'm there three four days a week, um, doing all kinds of aesthetic. Uh, restorative uh, uh, dentistry. The rest of the time I'm teaching um, and I teach for a variety of uh, people. So I do teach on the the King's um, restorative fixed removable um, master's program, um, uh, obviously in London. I've also taught on the Manchester MSC, the London uh, Hospital MSC in the past. Um, I also have a private training company, which is Denta or Dental Educational Resources. And I do run a, it's now become a seven day blended learning program in aesthetic restorative dentistry. So I have three intakes a year. Um, one, they all start in September. One is in London, where there's some places available. One is in Newcastle, which this year's intake is sold out already. And the other intake is in Birmingham. 
So if you are interested in learning more about me and the Aesthetic Restorative Program, then just visit denta.co. Uh, dot uk uh, you'll find out all about uh, all about that and i'll put this information up right at the very end of the presentation the other thing i do when i'm not practicing dentistry is travel um, talking about dentistry uh, particularly about composite materials and um, uh, cram preparations or ceramic preparations, uh, minimally invasive um, aesthetic dentistry. And I've been very fortunate pre-COVID to travel pretty much all around Europe and the Middle East and North Africa. And one of my last trips was actually to uh, to Egypt, to lecture in Egypt on posterior composites and anterior composites. Uh, I did manage to have dinner at the pyramids and what do I think of as a dental educator when I'm looking at the pyramids? Um, I often ask this of audiences and I get various answers like black triangle disease, bad cram preps. Um, I think a good one for this evening is longevity of restorations. Um, the best one I've ever heard was from a foundation dentist's group um, who said, um, this really reminds us of slave labor, um, which I thought was a bit harsh coming from newly qualified dentists. Um, but what it reminds me of, the pyramids, is the learning pyramid, which is the top of the pyramid, the little, uh, really represents that you've only taken in a small amount of information. And the base of the pyramid means that you have a sort of deep understanding of a subject. So if I just talk um, for the whole hour you and didn't show any pictures uh didn't show any videos you might remember about five percent of what i talk about if you read around a subject you remember ten percent if you see cases if you see some pretty pictures twenty percent um i'm going to show you some videos uh, demonstrating some materials um, but please do ask questions at the end if there's anything you're not clear on, if there's anything I say that you don't quite understand um, or that you agree or disagree with, by all means, um, uh, do participate by typing in the questions. And I think anything in dentistry, really, you have to practice it to, uh, to get any good. And this is very much how I teach um, any subject um, based on this learning pyramid um, idea. So when it comes to direct restorative materials, um, as I've already said, we have amalgam, we have composite, we have the glass ornament materials, improved glass ornaments, resin modified glass ornaments, and then this new material, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. And they all have their various pros and cons. Um, and as I've said, I'm a huge fan of direct composite. And I think when we can place rubber dam, we can place a nice sectional matrix and we can you know, build up with some bulk fill material and then layer some nice composite on top, do a little bit of sculpting. We end up with nice tight um, contact areas. We end up with a nice restoration. Um, if only everything was so simple. And you know, as I've already said, I'm working in a purely private practice. Most, I would say, 95% plus of my patients um, are very happy to, to pay my fees and are very happy to sit in the chair for an hour uh, or longer um, for one restoration. But obviously, amalgam has stood us very well in dentistry. Um, it's very quick. It's very cheap. Obviously, the big downside is it's not aesthetic. Uh, and the other big downside really these days, I mean, certainly patients don't want amalgam, I would say, on the whole in their mouths, unless they're faced with literally no choice whatsoever. And that's normally based on finances that they're choosing to, to go for an amalgam. Um, the, I mean, this is an upper molar no one really sees it apart from from dentists but certainly when we replace i'm replacing amalgam restorations now um, to reduce the amount of cavity preparation to keep the patients happy with in terms of um, uh, having something that's tooth-like i'm really choosing direct composite and in a situation like this 
all of these different stages, you know, having to prep the tooth under rubber dam, the etching procedure, the bonding procedure, putting down bases, and there's obviously various techniques for building up a posterior composite cusp by cusp. We have all the time in the world, we have the rubber dam in place, we have nice um, isolation. Um, the patient's quite happy to pay those fees. Um, so a posterior composite is absolutely the, uh, the, the way to go. But there are situations where either because of clinical reasons, like say a subgingival margin, uh, such as in this case, or time constraints, it might be that the patient can't keep their mouth open, um, you know, for the hour um, or sometimes longer if you may be doing a few restorations, like in, in this case here, um, the patient can't keep open for that long. Or it can be also for financial reasons that the patient perhaps can't afford the best possible uh, care with rubber dam treatment and sectional matrices and uh, and so on and so on. Um, there can also be situations like, say, treating a, a, a young child. Uh, perhaps it's a D or an E and the tooth is going to be exfoliated in a few years time. Um, what we're going to do for these uh, patients where even if you're not had to give any local anesthesia, just the sight and the smell of the uh, the etchant and the um, uh, the length of time taken to do the procedure can actually be quite demanding. And I know obviously some children can be very good. You can place rubber dam. Uh, some dentists um, uh, are very skilled with treating children, but I would say it's my uh, my opinion is that a lot of dentists would find that troublesome in, in a lot of children. So there's various reasons, clinical, time and financial. Um, treating children, as I've already mentioned, can be uh, difficult treating them with this ideal um, posterior composite. Sometimes treating elderly patients where they find it difficult to lie back in the chair for long periods of time um, or to tolerate rubber dam, which I, I don't find is too much of an issue, but some, some patients do find this difficult. Um, some patients do have problems with uh, like a claustrophobia. Um, special needs patients, patients that have to be anaesthetized or sedated or, or given a general anesthetic um, in hospital. Um, anxious patients perhaps can't tolerate such long treatment um, procedures. Patients finding it difficult to keep their mouth open, which can obviously be from any age group. And also patients that have large amounts of disease. Perhaps they've got... Um, uh, you know, several um, cavities, several large cavities all over their mouth. So you're having to do quadrant or even multi-quadrant dentistry with the amount of time that that's going to take. So there's there's various situations where we think, actually, you know, let's amalgam is going to be much quicker here, but really we want to put composite in um, or maybe let's just have a go with some glass onoma um, or some kind of strengthened glass onoma. And that, my experience is that's what a lot of dentists, um, both in the UK and around the world are doing, is more of a sort of what I really would consider patch up dentistry, either placing glass ornaments or improved GICs or resin modified GICs. Um, however, if we look at the, the literature on this, this is quite a recent paper from Operative Dentistry. And this is properties of new glass ornament materials marketed for stress bearing areas. So this is a lot to do with the um, uh, manufacturers that are uh, producing these um, strengthened glass ornaments. And obviously we can, we have, a, there's a lot of advantages to these strengthened glass ornaments than the old fashioned glass ornaments. Um, but what did this paper say from last year? That the conclusion was that really that fracture toughness was not improved with these new materials, even though that's really what they're designed for. Um, some of the materials um, do require resin coating and certainly resin coating, um, these materials, things like Equiforte, um, that does provide greater surface hardness. So I think really the conclusion from this is perhaps if it's a small class one cavity um, and you, you put on the resin coating, then fine. That's probably going to last and it's probably not going to last too badly. 
Um, however, if we're going to be placing class two restorations, large class two restorations, what's going to be the issue? And that really is chipping and bulk fracture of the material. And this is from some work um, conducted by uh, Densply Serona, um, which I should mention, I am a, a KOL, uh, sort of a key opinion leader for. And um, the what they looked at was fractures in class twos. Um, and this is using a chewing simulator. And they, they looked at a few different materials. So Fuji 2LC, um, so a light cured glass ornament, resin modified glass ornament. Uh, they looked at Equiforte and they looked at um, PBA, which is prime and bond active, which is a seventh generation or a universal uh, uh, adhesive and ceramics, which is or ceramic sphere tech or sphere tech XT, whichever you want to call it, which is a um, composite um, system from Densply Serona. And what did they find is that they had chipping uh, represented in the little blue dots here, um, below 100,000 cycles. With Equiforte, again, chipping below 100,000 cycles and bulk fracture below 400,000 cycles. Whereas with a well-placed composite with a um, dentin bonding agent, um, like one of the latest dentin bonding agents, you weren't getting fractures of the composite material. And that's really what we want is not to be getting fractures in our class twos. And I think sadly the problem is if we try and use sort of glass ornaments as a, um, a quick sort of get out of jail with these difficult patients, um, we can run into problems. Um, and certainly I've been guilty of this as well, as well as, I mean, I've talked, I mean, I speak to, I mean, I dread to think how many hundreds and hundreds of dentists a year. Um, and whenever I talk to dentists, they find this as well. Um, and the typical example is, oh, you know, it was a really, really tough case. The patient couldn't keep their mouth open. We put in some glass on them and we hope for the best. We thought, you know, it would maybe last for a year or two. And then we can always cut it back and put some composite on top. Um, and then lo and behold, three or four months in, um, the patient's phoning up, oh, it's chipped. I'm getting food stuck or it's fractured. Um, and then you're having to start all over again. And it's the same with treating children. If you're Got a, if you've got a class one, I have no issue with putting in some strength and glass onoma. Um, but if you've got a class two restoration, the, the simple fact is these are chipping and bulk fracturing, um, even in like these kids' teeth. And uh, that's then leading to, you know, a loss of confidence and how great a dentist you are. And it's also a hassle with the patient having to uh, to come back and take up uh, take up surgery time. So the traditional way that we place composite you know which is say placing a matrix doing our etching and bonding uh, light curing the bonding agent uh, a lot of dentists now are using a bulk fill like sdr um, light curing that capping it light curing again might be layer by layer or cusp by cusp light curing again and then finishing and polishing there are lots of stages to this the big advantage to something like a glass onoma or a resin modified glass onoma is that we can place a matrix, fill it, light cure it if it's um, a light cure material, um, and then we start to contour finishing polish straight away. Um, but as I've just said, the problem is, is that none of these glass onoma materials really, I think, are good enough in this type of class two situation. Um, so is there an answer? Well, I'm sort of pleased to say, really, I think that there really is, um, which is a new material from the Densply Serona, which is a new category of material. And I think that this is something that um, um, dentists really need to be made aware of, that there is this new category now of um, self-adhesive composite hybrids, of which Sureful One is the first. And essentially, what is it? It's the simplicity of a glass ornament with the stability of a conventional composite with a good aesthetic result. So what do I mean by that? I mean, no etching, no bonding. I mean, um, it's, a, it's a dual cure material. So it can be light cured and it will cure by itself. Um, it comes in a bunch of different shades um, from bleach white to A3.5. 
um, the results aesthetically are, I would say, not quite as good as a well-placed composite. Um, the technique is completely different from placing either a glass ornama or a composite. And that's really what I want to talk about, because I think this is the sort of material that I think dentists are going to want to evaluate for themselves. And I think the worry is, is that if you look at it as a glass ornament or if you look at it as a composite, um, you're going to go, no, this doesn't work. If you look at it as a new category of material, then you go, oh, I get it. Um, and having spoken to quite a number of dentists um, uh, around the UK about this and who are using it, as soon as they get their head round that this is a new category of material, um, they're very happy with it. If they don't get their head around that, then th there's, there's, uh, there's an issue. So really, what's the advantage with a material like this? Um, it's fast, just like a glass ornama, um, but it's durable. Um, and we'll come to the, the fracture toughness of it um, a little bit later. It's self-adhesive in nature, so we're not having to use any um, uh, phosphoric acid etch. We're not having to use any dentin bonding agent. So we save both time and money with not having to use etch or bond. We also, for our, say, ch um, children, um, uh, our child patients, we don't have that kind of fear of coming at them with smelly etch and smelly bonding agent. We can we can basically just fill the cavity straight away. Um, it's a true ultimate bulk fill. So there's no, you know, something like say SDR, which was the first bulk fill, has a four millimeter um, depth of cure. Some of the other bulk fills, you know, will will say, oh, it's a five millimeter depth of cure. This though is an ultimate bulk fill. So if you want to fill up, you know, an eight millimeter, 10 millimeter deep cavity with it, um, it's absolutely fine because it's a dual cure material. And that dual cure means that you can set it for 20 seconds and the rest of the cavity will auto cure in six minutes. So essentially it's fill the cavity, um, light cure for 20 seconds. Um, that's enough to stabilize the material, to cure the occlusal surface and to cure to a depth of about two millimeters, maybe slightly more than two millimeters. Um, the rest of the material will auto cure in six minutes. Now that six minutes is from the start of activation. And that's this is a really important point. It's a very, very fast setting material with a very short working time. And I'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, the big advantages of materials like this is, and this is why a lot of dentists use or well, try and use glass onomers, is that it's less complicated, less contamination, less room for error, shorter um, uh, treatment times, and that can lead to higher patient comfort. And what I'm going to do, I'm just going to show you a little video. Um, this is not created by me. This is actually a Dentsply Serona video, just, and I've got a video from myself a little bit later. But it comes in a, uh, a glass ionomer style capsule, pops into an amalgamator. It's uh, shaken for 10 seconds. And if you have a Rotomix machine, which I have, um, it's eight seconds. So 10 seconds in most machines, um, eight seconds for a Rotomix. And then it's just dispensed into the cavity um, all in one go, just keeping the nozzle within the material. So you're not, one thing you mustn't do is sort of squirt a bit in, then tap it into place, and then add a little bit more, and then tap it into place and try and do that because the material is very rapidly setting. You just have to fill the cavity in one go um, and then use a large instrument like a flat plastic, a ball burnisher, or this pyramid with a little round-ended pyramid shape, um, pack it into place. And then once it's light cured for your 20 seconds, then you can immediately start to finish and polish. Um, fine diamonds, uh, white, polishing stones. Um, I quite like to use enhanced finishes. Um, something like, you know, fine rugby ball. This is an enhanced finisher, something like this. Um, the important thing is to use water spray. So this is a pogo just to get a very high shine on the material. Um, 
and that's the job done. So it's a very different technique to traditional composite. Um, and it's also very difficult, very different to glass onomer because glass onomer goes through a uh, various stages of setting where you can still sculpt and manipulate the material. Um, this has a very quick snap set a minute 30 from moment of activation. So you really don't get long to um, to place the restoration at all. And it's not like composite where you can really sculpt the material too much. You've just got to get a very basic anatomy, very simple anatomy, and then you will put your anatomy in with your finishing diamonds or finishing um, uh, white stones or your finishing enhance um, and, and such like. Um, so it's it's a very different technique to, as I say, to glass on them or to, uh, to composite. Now, clinically, what does it, this look like? Um, this is uh, 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 one of my cases. So we have a, an occlusal cavity. Um, this is obviously extremely close up. And then I've filled with um, Sureful one here, and you'll see it's a little bit rough, it's a little bit grainy in terms of the surface texture when it first goes in. And but after finishing and polishing, maybe this takes about 30 to 60 seconds, we can actually get a gloss on the material. And the my finishing and polishing of choice is, um, as I said, Enhance and Pogo. Um, uh, from Dense by Serona, and that's initial placement, immediately finishing and polishing. And what you will find is that the material, I would say, looks even better after a week or two in the mouth. Um, as it sort of rehydrates uh, the material, um, after it's just been in the mouth, the, the tooth's rehydrated, the material's maybe rehydrated a little bit, um, it's got a bit of saliva on it. it, it seems to blend in very, very nicely. But it, as I've mentioned already, it doesn't have the very high aesthetics of a well-placed high-end composite. And I don't really see it as a replacement for traditional composite techniques that I use and teach. Um, I see this for your difficult restorative cases where you might want to reach for your amalgam or you might want to reach for a glass onomer and hope for the best. But in reality, you're looking for something like this, I think. It's just that this hasn't really been around until relatively recently, and certainly not on the UK market until very recently. So in terms of the chemistry, uh, I'll just keep keep this very brief, because as I've said, I'm a um, very much a uh, wet finger dentist, not a material science scientist. Um, but the key to the material is something called the MOPOS uh, molecule or the modified polyacid system. And this essentially is a polymer that chemically bonds to the tooth, rather like a self-etch adhesive. So we're used to self-etching adhesives, um, that, you know, things like um, uh, prime and bond active, things like Scotch bond universal. Um, we're, we're used to using things like self etching adhesive resin cements like Reliax Unisem. Um, so these have been around in dentistry for some time, but they're not really strong in themselves. They're not structural. Um, so that's how it's kind of bonding to the tooth. And I'll go into this in a bit more detail shortly. Um, and then it also contains these highly active crosslinkers that bond to the resins, the polyacids, and the glass fillers. And these form a very dense network that creates high mechanical strength. So that's the key. So this is this MOPOS uh, molecule. And you have essentially, um, it's, it's a very long molecule, as I'll show you in the video coming up. Um, but you have in red here these um, uh, cross-linkers that will bond to um, calcium within the tooth. And you have these little side arms that will then link um, to themselves to form this dense network. So this little video just shows some of its constituents, which is acrylic acid. Um, this is your MOPOS molecule. You have some glass filler. It is a water-based reaction, so you have water within the material, which is good, seeing as you know we normally have a bit of water in teeth. This has always been an issue. 
And then this is just showing how the MOPOS is um, bonding to the uh, calcium uh, within the uh, within the tooth. And again, this is just sort of showing off the MOPOS molecule, which obviously Dense Plicerona are very proud of. Um, spending all their money on uh, fancy computer animations. And you have these interfaces to the calcium ions, and as I say, these cross-linkers. And because you have so many of these calcium in interfaces all throughout the material, and also you have so much cross-linking going on, this is why you get this um, really, really dense network. So you have these um, cross-linking groups, you have initiators within the material, and everything essentially is bonding to everything else and is cross-linking to everything else. This is just showing the cross-linking. You get these initiators that set up the cross-linking here, and it also bonds to the uh, and links to the glass fillers within the uh, within the material. So you just end up with this very, very um, dense, um, very structurally sound network, and also this self-etching system, which is similar to um, self-etching adhesives and self-etching um, um, cements. So as I say, it's, it's, it's very much a unique new category um, of material. So in terms of the science and what's the science behind it, um, if you want to get sort of deep into the material and look at the material and look at this new class of materials, then the Journal of Adhesive Dentistry, um, issue one from 2020, uh, this is uh, Professor Frankenberger and Professor Van uh, Mierbeck, and they looked at this in quite a bit of detail. They were looking at amalgam alternatives and really critically evaluating them in terms of um, um, marginal quality wear, fracture resistance, um, staining resistance, and so on. The adhesion, they did the chewing simulation cycles, staining to tea and coffee and red wine, the shade stability. Um, they wrote, they, they got all these papers together, wrote it all up um, in, uh, uh, in, in, this, um, in, in this journal last year. And a lot of that is summarized in the scientific manual. I mean, I appreciate on, I mean, we have a lot of dentists um, and uh, I'm, I'm sure some therapists and, and others. Um, everybody is slightly different. Some people want to know literally everything about it and all the science. And it may well be we have some uh, academics um, listening in and watching in tonight. The, the best resource really, I would say, is this. This is the scientific manual for Sureful One. And you can just type in Sureful One uh, scientific manual dot PDF and you'll come up with this. I think it's something like 60 pages long, which has a lot about the chemistry. It has a lot of the um, data on the actual um, uh, material itself. So just type in scientific manual, sure for one. So I'm not going to read out this entire manual to you. I just want to mention a couple of the studies. Um, so one is the self-adhesive nature of the material, and that's the shear bond strength. So if we look at um, Scotch Bond Universal, which you know is a highly rated um, uh, seventh generation um, universal adhesive, we'll look at Equiforte, again, great material, very, very well rated, and then we'll look at Sureful One. And in blue here, we have the, the enamel um, uh, shear bond strengths. So 22 megapascals, 18 megapascals, and 20 megapascals. So it's they're, they're pretty comparable, I would say, to with when it comes to enamel. So that's the self-adhesive nature. When we come to dentine, Scotch Bond Universal is actually uh, Equiforte to dentine is not so great. Um, sure for one, you know, is comparable to the bond strengths that you would be getting from your Scotch Bond Universal to the dentine. So we've got, you know, very good 
bond strengths to dentine and to enamel with this new type of uh, product. Then we'll also look at enamel wear, uh, or sorry, like enamel in inverted commas. So basically just wear of the restoration, uh, simulated wear. And what they looked at was a few different composites. So Filtex Supreme, Heliomolar, um, Ceramics. Um, then they looked at some Glassonomers, Equiforte and Fuji 2LC. And then they looked at Surefill 1. And in terms of um, what you found with the composites, which is low amounts of um, uh, wear with Equiforte, much higher amounts of wear with Fuji 2LC even higher. And with Surefill 1, you know, comparable um, wear to a you know, a good quality composite. So, because that's always been a, an issue, I think, with the um, the glass armor materials. It's not just the the fracture resistance; it's the wear, which is why some of the products on the market, you know, come with these resin coatings um, to reduce the uh, the amount of wear. Um, and then the final thing I mentioned, I showed this uh, this table right at the very beginning. So we already know that with Fuji 2LC, Equiforte, um, we're getting chipping and um, uh, bulk fracture um, before 400,000 cycles. Um, with prime and bond active ceramics, so a well-placed composite, um, which is with a, a seventh generation bonding agent, um, we're getting success, which is what the little green circle uh, represents. And with Surefill 1, we're getting the same. So we're not getting that chipping. We're not getting that bulk fracture um, in the chewing simulation. So that really says to me that we're quite safe using this in class 2 situations. Um, so now I'm not worried if I put something in like a D or an E, uh, or even an adult patient. Um, that's a class two that I'm going to be worried about this fracturing uh, and the patient coming back after six months or even after a few years. This really should be performing just like a uh, traditional composite, traditional um, placed composite. Um, in terms of clinical feedback, um, there's been a, this has been on the market in Germany for a few years and also in the USA. Um, the first clinical evaluation from Germany, just a small group that looked at post-op sensitivity. Um, you're looking at 1,300 restorations, less than 1% post-op sensitivity. Um, the same in the US. Um, it's kind of a requirement for these products to enter the market that they have sensitivity um, evaluations. And that's why these first um, uh, studies that were done on about post-op sensitivity. Um, and also it's quite an easy study to, uh, uh, to do. So again, a small study, 60 restorations. There was only one patient with some post-op sensitivity. Um, and a bigger study with over a thousand restorations in the US, the majority of the dentists said it's better than the current material they use in these compromised clinical situations. So going back to what I said at the beginning, um, I, th I think for, for quite a few dentists, this could be seen as very much as an amalgam substitute. I don't see it as a composite substitute in my practice if everything is ideal like the patient can afford it the patient can keep their mouth open uh, the patient can tolerate rubber dam i've got ideal situations but as we know it depends on the type of practice you're in i mean i know obviously some dentists if they're working in community if they're working in a um, hospital environment if they're working with very anxious patients um, sedated patients anesthetized patients um, you know it might be 90 percent of their work is a compromised clinical situation um, in which case i can see this being um, a, a huge advantage um, if you're working like myself in purely private practice you may be thinking well you know i've, I've still got five ten percent of my cases that i can see a real use for this and particularly say with children's teeth um, it, it's really going to depend on the type of practice uh, type of practice you're in 
And then the final thing I really wanted to say, because um, we've got about five five minutes or so um, before we, we, we break for, for any questions, um, is really about the instructions for use with these new products. And I think this goes true for every single uh, material that we use as clinicians in that we're very bad at reading instructions. I know from teaching uh, composites, uh, direct composites, anterior and posterior, one problem that a lot of dentists have is finishing and polishing. And it's not that they're not using great products. It's normally that they're not using them correctly. And the reason that they don't use them correctly is because they've never read the instructions or never understood the instructions. And quite often, dentists don't even ever get to see the instructions because their assistant opens the box, throws away all the instructions, and just puts the material in the drawers. Um, so it's it's always helpful, I think, to if, it, if you're getting a new material into the practice, that you really, really, really read the instructions and understand the instructions. And the instructions, uh, uh, although there is a full instruction booklet, they've also summarized the instructions on a little card. And the important bit to look at there is the one minute, um, 30 seconds working time. And you'll see that that one minute, 30 seconds starts at the moment of activation by the time you press the capsule. Um, you've activated the capsule, you mix it for 10 seconds or eight in a rotor mix. You place it, the capsule into the extruder, you squirt it into the cavity, you pack it into place, slightly overfill and uh, over contour, um, and then leave the material alone. Um, once it starts to go off, it's best to leave it alone. Otherwise, you'll start to flake bits of material out of the restoration. Um, so that means you have to be incredibly fast. You can't act, you, your assistant can't activate it and then go and do something else for 20, 30 seconds or activate it and you're not ready to place it into the cavity. Um, it's got to be pretty much the moment it's activated, everyone's going to be, right, mixing machine, out the mixing machine, into your hands, into the into the tooth. Um, it's a very, very fast um, working time. And this is very unlike any glass ornament in terms of working time. Now, some people say, well, uh, why don't they make it with a longer working time? The simple answer is you can't that the chemistry is so unique, is so new, that's what you've got. And uh, I'm, I'm not too sure that they'll ever be able to uh, to change that working time. But it, you know, somebody clever might come along and, and work that out. So essentially, you activate it, you mix it for your 10 seconds, you put it into the extruder gun. And then what my assistant does is she goes click, 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 three clicks until you can see a little bit come out of the uh, the tip of the nozzle and then it just goes straight in to the cavity and that dispensing procedure is 60 seconds max and then you can shape now i'm just going to show you a little video on a model uh, of my of my placing and and uh, the material i just wanted to mention because you're going to see it in the video um, a new type of matrix band which is a paladent 360 so we have essentially two types of matrix band, passive and active. I'm a big fan of sectional matrices for posterior composites. Um, sometimes, though, they can be difficult to place, or you might have very, very large cavities. Um, uh, and so instead of placing a sectional matrix, um, like, so, like I showed you earlier, to, you know, or you know, in this case, to create these nice, beautiful, um, tight contacts, um, I, I'm actually using a 360 uh, degree, but the difference is this is anatomically contoured um, and you don't have the big handle. So this is a Paladent 360. It's a fairly new matrix to the market. Um, it's also compatible with um, the, the bitine rings, like the rings that you would use, the nickel titanium rings um, to separate the teeth. So you can use it, say, in large MODs, and you can use it in combination with rings to get even tighter contacts. But it's a very nice, thin um, matrix band with its own built-in um, tightener. 
So it's it's a big improvement on um, something like an auto matrix. So the only reason I show this really is because you're going to see it in the video, and I know I'll probably get questions like, "What's what's that matrix band?" So this is the, uh, the little demonstrations. This is me um, just with a model, and we've got what you'll see down the right hand side is a, um, a stopwatch, a clock, which will start to count down from the moment that I um, activate the material. So the first thing I'm going to do is just place a Paladent 360. So we pop that around the tooth. Takes That's a little bit of a knack to using them. Um, I know when I first started placing them on patients, they're a bit tricky. It's, it's very important that you assess how tight the contacts are first and strip the contact or wedge the contact first. And then I've activated the uh, Surefill one. And you'll see the moment of activation, the stop clock, or the stopwatch, I should say, is uh, is running. So we're already at 16 seconds, and I haven't got anywhere near the tooth yet. And this is me with doing everything with the amalgamator, with the Rotomix right next door to me. And you see it's 30 seconds has already gone. And I'm working pretty quickly. So now we get it into the cavity. And I start injecting. And you keep the nozzle pretty much within the material. Don't be lifting in and out. Don't be trying to pack a little bit in. Just bulk fill. And you can see now 50 seconds have gone by. And I'm just going to pack it into place. I'm not doing any trying to do any kind of fancy shaping, just some very basic anatomy and removing little bits of excess. But if anything, just have it slightly overfilled so you can easily um, uh, trim back and smooth it back. And now you see I'm at 1 minute 20. So the material is going to start pretty much going off now-ish. Um, I've just i got a little bit more time to play because I can feel the material. but when And then I'm just going to tidy up the marginal ridge with a probe, get rid of a little bit of excess there. And now, really, I'm at 1 minute 40 from activation. That's the material you know, starting to go off. So at that, that point, I'm stopping. And then I'm going to light cure the material for 20 seconds. Um, the, don't forget the, by the time I put my instruments down, I then take the light cure over. Now maybe two minutes, slightly more has, um, has gone by. Um, the rest of the material is setting already as well. Now, if you have a very deep cavity, then the ideal is to wait a full six minutes um, from the moment of activation. Um, so you might have to leave that for a few minutes. But as you'll see in this case, um, the just that light and, and alone, um, we've been able to remove the band immediately. And what we have is no voids. That's the important thing. So just to summarize, um, just my thoughts on the subject, really, uh, and on this material. I would say it's very much unlike anything else. There is a learning curve to it. You do have to be very fast with it. When you finish and polish the material, you need to use water spray. Otherwise, it will really look dried out. As I say, it's based on water. Uh, sorry, the, the uh, chemistry is water-based. Um, it does contain water. Um, you don't want to desiccate it. It looks much better finished and polished with uh, with water spray, and you will find that it looks better um, after a week or two th a week or two in the mouth. Okay, so those are my thoughts. Um, so I'm just going to put up my information before we um, stop sharing my um, slides. So if you do have questions about anything I've said right at the beginning about you know, the pros and cons of different materials, uh, about difficult cases and how you might manage them. Uh, if you have questions about the Surefill 1 material, um, do type them in, but do make a note of my details, like 
get your phones out and take a picture or do a screen capture or whatever. Um, but if I don't go through your question, then by all means, email me. Um, I've got no idea how many questions we have. We might have one, we might have a hundred. I've got no idea. So do drop me an email, ianclinatmac.com. Um, and for anybody that joined late, I did also mention um, that I do run a seven day program, uh, seven day face to face, but it's blended learning. So it's basically an online training platform which integrates with the seven days face to face. And it covers um, quite a large amount of aesthetic restorative dentistry from uh, clinical photography to digital smile design um, using Photoshop. Um, to anterior composites as a whole day on anterior composites, a whole day on posterior composites, two prep days on all ceramic um, type restorations, um, uh, a day on occlusion and TMJ and splints. So all of the information about my course, um, Newcastle is already sold out for the September intake. Um, London, there's still some places available. And Birmingham, there's still some places available. So if you want to find out about that, just visit www.denta.co.uk. So I'm just going to stop sharing. And then we're going to try and look at your, uh, look at your questions, hopefully. So... Hopefully, we have some questions here. Attendees questions. Do we have any questions? That is the question. Aha, we do have questions. Good. Sorry, I'm using a new system called uh, WorkCast. Um, and uh, so in no particular order, we, see, we do have a bunch of questions. So hopefully we can get through these in the next uh, 10 minutes and we'll finish soon after eight. And if you do have any other questions, please do, please do type them in. Um, so, okay, that's a good question. So the first question, I won't read out who's asked the question because uh, that should be obvious to the person. And um, I don't think anybody needs to know who's been asking questions. But the, the question is, um, what's the difference between the previous compromas like Dirac? So, I mean, the, the big thing with Direct, which is also a dense supply Serona product and very, very popular for a long time, is that that was kind of a mix between glass onoma and composite, but it wasn't self-adhesive, or excuse me, it isn't self-adhesive in, uh, in nature. So it's very, very different um, chemistry. Also, Direct isn't ultimate bulk fill. It's not a dual cure. It's a light cure. Um, material. So it, it, is a, it is a very different uh, product. Don't get me wrong, the, in terms of chemistry, the, a lot of these products, you know, have various components, various acids, various glass fillers, um, and the like, and photo initiators. So if you just look at like a recipe list, they can sound similar, and they can look similar. But the different ways of making them uh, and the different chemistry, particularly with this MOPOS molecule, is what makes it um, unique. Um, that's the simplest, I think, way of describing it. Uh, okay, so another question. As you need to use water when finishing, this is an AGP. This will have an impact on fallow time. So we'll, hopefully the fallow time will end somebody will see sense on this before too long and the fallow time will end um my understanding with um with it it's not that you can't use it um without water so i think if that was a real concern to have water um there, there are a few ways around that my understanding is if you run your handpiece very slow so i use electric hand pieces so if you're running them at um, I believe it's below 60,000, but no, I tell a lie. If you're running it sort of like 10,000 RPM, which is fast enough for finishing and, um, and polishing the, the, these materials, then it's actually not creating an AGP with the electric. So, so this is why a lot of the dental schools have gone over to electric handpieces. Um, you could 
and I don't see any problem really with maybe just putting some glycerin on the uh, on the tooth and running it without water spray. Um, again, you'd have to run it slowly um, so as not to create an AGP. Um, but, and I say electric hand pieces run slowly. Um, you need to just double check the uh, the speeds because um, because to be honest, my chair has everything pre-programmed, so I don't tend to think about it too much. Um, next question: Can shuffle be placed on top of um, other materials like calcium hydroxide? Um, yes is a simple answer i personally if i was ever using i mean i tend not to use calcium hydroxide too much i tend to use mta or um, biodentine but if i was using uh, calcium hydroxide maybe if there was like a little tiny pulp exposure or i could see a bit of pink then i would tend to place calcium hydroxide protect the calcium hydroxide um, with something like a light cured glass on first and then place my restorative um the yeah and relates to in deep cavities does it need a lining or is it compatible with the pulp i mean there, there was a big um study in the published in the british dental journal a few years back and if anybody wants to, i mean i can dig out the, the paper and if and i can find the reference for you um but there was a there was a big study looked at this and the simple answer is and the way that i do things is if you can't see any pink you can't see any pulp then it there's no indication for aligning if you can see some pink if you can see the pulp then that means you're very very close you know half a millimeter millimeter to the pulp then you probably do want to place something just just the merest hint, just the merest cover um, uh, of that pink or red area. Um, and then calcium hydroxide still has its uses and then protect the calcium hydroxide and then place your place your restoration. Um, if I can't see, you know, you can't stick this stuff on top of pulp or you can't, and I wouldn't, and I would, if I could see pink, I would protect it either with MTA, biodentine or calcium hydroxide. Um, but otherwise, it doesn't need a lining. It's just like placing um, uh, placing a um, uh, placing a composite. Uh, so I'm just going through. I've got a little tiny box. I can't see all the questions. Uh, given that the bond strength and shear bond strength are good and aesthetics are good, what's stopping you using it as a composite replacement, even in your ideal patient circumstances? Um, so to be honest, I think there'd be nothing for some dentists. I think aesthetically, it's good enough. It's not as good. I would say as a well-placed composite. So it's not highly aesthetic. Um, it's a little bit more, it's nothing like as opaque as something like a glass onoma, but it's um, uh, it's, it's certainly, uh, it's a bit more opaque than a traditional, you know, good quality composite. Um, the other thing for me is the way that I like to build anatomy into my restorations. So, you know, if you've got a fairly worn down, flat old dentition where you're going to be placing pretty worn down, flat restorations, I wouldn't see necessarily a problem with placing this and just keeping the anatomy very simple. But if you have younger patients with some anatomy that you're wanting to, uh, you know, create something approaching nature, um, you're going to have to try and do that subtractively um, with burrs. Um, and I'd prefer to build cusp by cusp and uh, create my anatomy that way. Um, but I think if you were, and also it depends really on what your fee structure is. If you're, um, I think if your fees are, say, low, then I think, like, say, for a posterior composite, um, then I think this could be, be a perfectly good um, option. Um, it's just that 
I, I think I just see the way that dentistry is going is that people doing posterior composites now are wanting to get higher and higher and higher aesthetics. Uh, and there's certainly a good demand from patients for higher and higher aesthetics. But from another population group, they just want a white filling. So to be honest, they'd probably even be happy with the, you know, um, a glass onomer if it's going to going to last for a long time in terms of aesthetics. So I think it very much depends on um, your practice and um, uh, patient base. Uh, next question. Can this be used as a bulk fill with a superficial composite layer to finish? If so, which composite would be compatible? Um, yes, absolutely. So you can just use it as a bulk fill. It's not really what it's kind of designed for, but um, there'd be nothing stopping you, say, placing this, cutting it back, or like leaving it short, light curing it, cutting it back, and then placing something um, more aesthetic on top. The The problem there is that you then have to go through the, the etch and the bonding procedure for the top bit. And it kind of like takes away the, the purpose of using Surefill 1 in the first place. However, let's say you have a case where um, you know, you've done the lower right 7654 in Surefill, and then you want to upgrade those restorations in six months' time, and you just want to cut back, you know, the top millimetre or two, and then put some um, composite on top um, The with, you know, with nicer anatomy and all the rest of it. The um, Any composite would, would be absolutely fine. I mean, I personally am a big fan of... Um, Ceramic Sphere Tech or Sphere Tech ST, uh, as it's now known. Um, very simple composite system. Um, pretty much every composite case I think I've shown in my lectures for the last five or six years have all been um, um, Ceramic Sphere Tech. Um, so, but any composite is compatible. Any composite. Um, if you need more than one capsule, do you need to fill uh, back to back? Can you top up on existing material? Um, yes. I mean, what I would do is I wouldn't like cure it. I would basically, if I was, if I had, I mean, there is quite a lot of material in there. Um, I can't think if I've ever had to add, um, to be honest, but if I did, I would just have my assistant ready to say, oh, this is a really huge cavity have my assistant ready with um with another capsule as i've squirted it all in and i'm and i'm like i've used it and i know there's not enough i'm saying to my, i'm saying to elena mix the next one activate it mix it by the time i've packed it all in then i'm ready just to squirt some more in or you could like cure it like just for 10 seconds just to stabilize that surface and then squirt some more on top uh, you wouldn't need to like cure it and refresh it or do anything like that it will just bond to itself uh, would you advise surefill for anterior restorations um, basically no um, i would do it in a traditional way i don't think there would be anything like terrible if you used it for a for a anteriors but really it's not designed for that it's designed as a posterior um, restorative material um, if say you had you know some root caries on a patient that's not you know an anterior case uh, you just want to get something in there quickly um, I don't see any issue really with using something like Surefill one other than that it's not as aesthetic as um, uh, a traditional composite uh, I think we've got uh, that's the same question. Can you add a second capsule? Yes. Um, is Surefill strong enough to be used to build up cusps? Yes. Although, you know, if you are looking at building up cusps, you, you're often then looking at going indirect at some point. But there's no problem, say, if you're missing one cusp, um, building up one cusp. Um, the Another good question, does Surefill 1 release fluoride and to what extent? Um, simple answer is yes, it does. Um, and the the initial release is less than a traditional glass onomer. Um, but after sort of 30 days, 60 days, the charts are actually in the, um, the Surefill 1 manual 
um, so the uh, scientific manual, um, which actually shows you the comparisons of fluoride release. So initially, like traditional glass ornaments have by far and away the highest fluoride release, and then they drop. Um, something like direct, which has been in favor a lot for um, fluoride release, um, again, drops, is lower, and then it drops. And it's pretty comparable, I would say, to um, direct, particularly after something like, you know, 20, 30 days in the mouth. But if you if the person that asked that question, if anybody wants to know about fluoride release, just drop me an email or, uh, and I can give you the exact data, or you can uh, take a look at the scientific um, manual. Okay, uh, and then the final question. Oh, actually I've got a couple. So there is a question about price point. Now I'm not a salesperson. Um, the, the price point you would need to speak to somebody from Dentsply Serona, just get on, get on the phone to your local rep um, or drop me an email, I can pass your, your details on. Um, the price point I personally do not know. Um, I think it's pretty comparable to using a composite um, with your etch and bond. So it's a more, it's pricier than a reinforced glass ornament is the, uh, is the simple uh, uh, answer. And the final question I'm going to take, and then we will say goodbye. Um, there's, a, there's actually two questions which are both very um, similar, um, which is, are there any long-term studies on durability? And would this sort of material be suitable as a core restoration? And is it strong enough for a Nia core? So the, my view is that it's, I actually personally tend to use SDR, um, bulk fill material as a core material, which it really wasn't designed for. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's, an it's, it's more than acceptable material as a, as a core material, as a, as a composite. And I don't see any reason why Surefill One can't be used as a core material uh, and using it as a Nia core. Um, the long-term studies, the simple answer is no, because it's a relatively new material. It's actually been in development because I was involved um, very, very early with testing the material, um, and just like the handling and the smell and the, you know, the, uh, the properties of the material and the whole concept um, more than 10 years ago. So this has been a long time in development. Um, a lot of studies really are in terms of its strength and uh, bond strengths are lab studies. Um, most of the uh, studies on patients really have related to um, post-op sensitivity. Um, but I don't see any reason why this can't be used as a core material. Um, but if you want the definitive answer, I would speak to your dense by Serona rep, but I don't see any reason why not. A, a, a lot of dentists that I've spoken to that are using it um, like it as a core material. I mean, it preps very, very nicely. It preps very like dentine. Um, and also, you know, it's it's far, far stronger than putting a glass on a core in there, which really isn't indicated. So comparing it to any other composite core, then I absolutely, I'd be very happy with it. Good. So I'd just like to say a big thank you to uh, to everybody. Um, I'm not quite sure how I end the meeting, so it might be uh, it doesn't end that gracefully. I'm not too sure. Uh, it might just be literally we go off. Um, but I'd just like to say a big thank you to all the questions and for everybody's attention. Um, I think it's going to be it's it's been recorded, so you'll be able to uh, view it back. Um, and uh, as I say, if you have questions that I, I think I managed to answer all the questions that came through. Um, some some are obviously quite a bit quite similar to, to, to each other, um, but I think I've gone through all the questions. Um, but if anybody does have any other questions, then drop me an email, Ian Klein, uh, my name, at mac.com. And if anybody's interested in the your course in aesthetic restorative, so I say Newcastle's full, London's available, Birmingham's available, starts in September. Take a look at denta.co.uk. And I'd just like to wish you all a good evening and um, uh, enjoy the sun while it's going down. Thank you. Mm -hmm.